I'm sure you've all been keenly awaiting more information about Digital Design's new M series amplifiers being the M2000, 4000 and 8000 variants. Ever since information and photos of these smaller powerhouses have emerged, the resounding question has been, are these full bridge? This question is always asked with the wrong idea or assumption in mind. When you hear the word Fullbridge, what do you think of? It's probably amps like Taramp, Stetson, Sound Digital, Banda and other Brazilian brands, whereas no one really thinks about JL Audio Slash, Alpine MRP and MRV, Orion 2500D, MTX Thunder, JBL GTO and Crown and many other brilliant, well-respected amplifiers over the years. Being Fullbridge or not changes absolutely nothing about an amplifier's sound, performance, or reliability, it only dictates whether one terminal drives the load and it can be strapped, or if both terminals drive the load in push-pull. That's all it means. The real question everyone's meaning to ask when they say, is it full bridge, is really, is it a Brazilian circuit design? The answer is no. This is not a Brazilian circuit design that has been copied or cloned and made elsewhere in Asia. It is a typical Korean circuit that happens to be half bridge, so you can strap it. My point is, stop labeling amps that are full bridge with amps that are Brazilian. There's no relation, um, and I'll do a more in-depth video covering this shortly. With that out of the way, let's take a detailed look at the M4000 model that which I have here. First thing that I noticed was this thing has some weight. The heatsink is a freaking unit, very thick and solid, and the same goes for the PCB. Extremely thick traces will allow for high current flow with minimal losses in this. Look at the weight comparison between this 4K amp and a Brazilian 8K. Even with half the rated power, it's still significantly heavier. As a result, the thermal mass of this dense heatsink will be perfect for keeping the amp cool under extended demos and hot environments. You can see everything is pretty densely packed in, as you would imagine, so let's go over the circuit. The switch mode power supply section is this half, taking the 12 volts and stepping up to plus minus 130 volts, ready for the amplifier section over on this side. Being a half bridge amplifier, since only the positive terminal drives the load, high enough rails are required to allow for this. If it was full bridge instead, the rails would only need to be plus minus 65 volts. Another misconception that full bridge amps are high voltage is actually the opposite. The power supply consists of four smaller transformers that parallel after rectification, which I'm a big fan of over having one single large transformer. It has been proven that multiple smaller parallel transformers like this offer better reliability and headroom. Each transformer is driven by four MOSFETs, two push and two pull. The FETs here are the commonly seen IRF3205, dating back to the late 1990s and used in hundreds of amplifiers over the last 20 years. I'm glad to see low value gate resistors here. Many recent amplifiers coming out of Korea have had ridiculously high values, which soft switches the FETs in order to abide to EMI regulations, which isn't ideal for maximum power delivery. The FETs are driven by a pair of 4427 ICs, which are very strong and reliable, and they run very cool in this setup. The power supply is controlled by a generic Korean PWM generation board using the old KA7500 or TL494 chip. This board will also handle protection, remote turn on and relay engage if a relay is present. You can see the low voltage protection disable switch here, sometimes used in extreme power limited competition classes. Digital designs have decided not to populate this switch here. The power supply capacitors are these CAPSCON 3300 microfarad. Power supply switching frequency is fixed at 26 kilohertz, not optimized for these specific smaller transformers for optimum power throughput though. Output from the transformers is rectified by a set of eight ultra fast rectifiers and a nice addition is these chokes on the DC output from the rectifiers, killing any remaining high frequency noise before passing on to the Samyong 2200 microfarad rail caps. The output section in this is actually a scaled back smaller version of what you'd see in the Digital Designs Z2B and Z2C amplifiers, which is one of the standard Class D architectures that this factory offers. This half bridge driver card takes the modified audio wave from the preamp and converts it into high and low side pulses using the TL072C and LM311. The IRS2184 driver chip from around 2006 takes these pulses and splits them into high and low side drive ready for the FETs. On this board, the FETs are directly driven by the 2184 chip with no buffers, which causes it to run a little toasty. I got 65 degrees Celsius here on the open bench idle, but there is a fan mounted directly above on the backplate to allow for some airflow to circulate, keeping it cool. 
The output FETs are FDA38N30, first seen used at around 2010. There are pads here for Zener diodes between a gate and source, which would help clamp the FETs down on turnoff, but it wasn't deemed necessary with the 38N30s as they aren't difficult to drive and they turn off pretty quickly anyway. Output switching frequency is a sensibly low 105kHz, perfect for reliable, efficient production of subwoofer frequencies. It doesn't need to be any higher than that for this. The gate drive is pretty strong and well managed with a nice shape on the gate. The output section is actually composed of two output banks, each side able to supply 2000 watts RMS into a 2 ohm load, which then parallel together after the inductors to drive the 1 ohm load to 4000 watts. There's no isolation relay in this amplifier, which is a little unexpected. There is almost no turn on pop whatsoever from the nicely designed output section. However, in the event of damaged FETs or drive circuit, there is a chance that due to there not being a relay, the connected speakers would receive full DC rail voltage on power up before the amplifier realizes what's happening and protects. The filter network works effectively at filtering out the class D switch frequency with no audible noise floor through a connected driver when the amplifier is idle. The preamp circuit is beautifully simple, offering only gain, subsonic and low pass. No unnecessary boosts or phase dials which can cause issues with strapping. The crossover points are perfect for subwoofer application and the 24dB roll-off will provide a really nice smooth listening experience, one of the main issues with a lot of newer full range amps. The bass remote has a really smooth feel to the dial, it's a good potentiometer in there, but when it's brand new, take the voltage reading with a pinch of salt. The one I have here measured too low. Unfortunately, you can calibrate it using a small Phillips head through the little hole in the back here. The clip light is fast and responsive, if a little preemptive. The overall build quality is superb with all cores mounted incredibly tightly to the board, adhesive securing raised caps and resistors nicely, and a sweet touch is the DD branded wire used internally. Often the factory will just use whatever spare they have laying around at the time, which is why you sometimes see higher end amplifiers with audio pipe branded cabling inside. The transformer and inductor leads that lay across the tops are covered to protect against rubbing and shorting, which is cool. Almost all of the non-power passing components are surface mount, allowing the size of the board to be considerably smaller than if they were through hole. You've got nice solid quality Tiffany style RCAs as well used in the preamp. So to summarize the great features of the new M series amplifiers, they're extremely well built heavy tanks with a low idle current, low noise floor, sensible preamp filtering and a circuit design that stays true to the previous M series of amplifiers just in a more compact manageable package. They'll perform and sound as fantastic as you are used to experiencing with any other DD branded amplifier. However, as with any product, there are a few things which I think are worth mentioning about this. DD are marketing these amplifiers as using the latest in semiconductor technology to achieve the power density in this size package. As we touched on earlier, the semiconductor parts used in this amplifier date back to as far as 20 years ago and nothing else would have been holding it back from being built at the time. If this amplifier were to be designed again today, its size could be cut in half again by using cutting edge low RDS FETs, higher and better optimized power supply switching frequencies and single positive rail operation. But if that's the case, then why is nobody doing it? Designing a circuit from scratch is a long and hard process. It requires many months of prototyping, testing, revising, and it makes for a really expensive process. Some brands do do it though, which is why you'll find these products um, usually cost over and above the norm for their specifications. Um, so when there's already a tried and tested base circuit design available that you can shape and tweak to your liking, um, it allows for a much faster product development and a lower retail price. Because this amplifier is still built on the foundations of the older M series and the Z series, you don't get modern luxuries such as power up health check preventing the power supply meltdown in case of an output short, active current limiting for constant power across multiple loads like the Timer Smart series, or regulated power supply to provide constant power across a range of variable supply voltages like you do with the JLs. I also noticed that the RCA ground ring shares its ground with the output section as a whole, which includes the negative speaker terminal. Ideally, the RCA would have its own floating ground separate from both power supply and output grounds to minimize the introduction of noise to the signal path. The output driver runs the FETs directly as previously mentioned and works quite hard doing so. At these low output switching frequencies it would have been better to add some buffers to take the load off the chip and add some protection in the event of a MOSFET failure. Higher power FETs could then have been used without the risk of overworking the chip. The output FETs here are rated for 300 volts. 
When the amplifier is running at 14.4 volts of power input, the rails reach a potential difference of 260 volts, which there's enough headroom in those FETs. But running the amp at its highest rating of 16 volts brings the rail potential to 284 volts. It's still under the limit, but it's a bit close. It's a good idea to have a fair bit of voltage headroom when switching FETs to allow for ringing, bulge or spikes to be dealt with. Often amps with these kinds of rails will be fitted with 400 volt parts for that reason. It would have been nice to see a relay used here. Um, I imagine the reason it was excluded was for space saving, but it just adds that extra layer of safety for your expensive drivers and will always provide a dead silent power up sequence. All right, so now I've bored you all to death with the technical info on this amplifier. Let's do something a bit more fun. We're gonna take it out to the van and we're gonna mount this amplifier up onto my sixth order wall. Uh, okay, the build isn't really ideal for this 4,000 watt amplifier. I've got a sixth order wall with a pair of digital designs. Wait for this to brighten up a bit. Now I've got a sixth order wall with a pair of digital designs Z or Z4 15s. The best 15s that DD has ever made to date. Um, so naturally 4,000 watts RMS on these two subs is barely going to tickle them. It would have been better if I'd had the 8K, but we're going to still see how it performs and what it can do. The subs are dual twos and they wire down to 0.5. Now, people ask all the time, is my amplifier stable at 0.5? This is a really, really common question. People want to know if the amp will be okay at 0.5. Well, of course, all different kinds of amplifiers. And what people don't realize is it's not the amplifier itself that really dictates that. It's the rest of your system. Any one ohm stable amplifier in the world will be fine at 0.5 given enough impedance rise and given the right system in the same way that every single one ohm amplifier in the world will probably die or overheat at 0.5 given too close a 0.5 ohm resistive load. So if you've got a nice big box and efficient subwoofers like these Z4s, they'd rise through the freaking sky, which is why I'm able to run a uh, Tarams HD 10K at 0.5 for six months and it sounds amazing. Um, so you've got a nice big box, which is gonna allow easy excursion which will cause more impedance rise, or if you've got very efficient subs with strong motor force, um, then you're gonna have a good time at 0.5 because you'll have enough impedance rise for the amplifier to run pretty easy. You know, it's gonna be basically putting out the kind of power it's designed to at one ohm after rise or less with, with even more impedance rise. But when you've got uh, cheap subs with uh, weak motors and you're putting them in small boxes with large port area and you're playing tones roundabout tuning frequency and that amplifier is seeing like pretty much close to 0.5 or a little bit above for long extended periods then it's going to heat up it may die and you're going to have a bad time you're going to have a really inefficient experience loads of voltage drop and it's going to cause issues with the system so we are running this m4000.5 today but the rise is astronomical on this build um, so i'm not expecting it to be like ridiculously loud um, in the past i've had two korean four and a half k's strapped to 0.5 so each amp sees 0.25 and even after like four hours of demos they're still cool so the rise is ridiculous so i'm not expecting this to be crazy loud but i want to see what it does and I want to show some footage of it playing. There we go. Oh, doesn't it look cute? <laughs> Can't really argue with that. Uh, proper 70 mil welding cable going in there and battery banks under there. So let's take it out for a spin and see how it sounds. I think it's a little bit wonky actually, but now nah, it's coming out again in a minute, so it doesn't matter. So here we are down at the old basing spot and um, just gonna start off with a couple of demos really. Now obviously you can't tell how loud it is through a YouTube video through this microphone, but uh, fuck it, some people like watching the bass, you know, it should give you some ideas how loud it is. So we're gonna start off with just some um, gripping the grain. I've got like old school bass testers on here that I haven't used in years. So let's just go through these, see how they sound. And I've got the bass remote coming through the door around the side of the van because there's no passageway through the wall it's completely sealed off uh, and the cable for my old one is a different type of cable so we're just going through the door
So just on the edge of clip there, just flickering kind of on the kick drums and stuff like that. Um, it's potent for a 4K. Be interesting to see the dyno videos come out uh, once they're released. I'm pretty sure Derek will get one at some point and then we'll see some dyno videos come out of these, but it's definitely louder than I anticipated. Naturally, it's still a way off what I'm used to running in here, but um, it's definitely listenable. Like it's pushing these subs considerably well. So uh, my girl just got back from having her hair done, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to try and mess it up with this little uh, little 4K. I, I don't think it's going to lift it because it looks quite dense. Uh, hair tricks are best with lightweight hair, but we'll see. I'm actually quite surprised, it lifts it alright, doesn't it? Jesus, yes. yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> that's like, that's half the power that it usually is. Oh, I need to brush that through yeah, now. <laughs> it's not like a wild hair trick, like a really intense, brutal hair trick. You know, you see some of these videos. Um, but for, for 4K, and bear in mind, this is a massive cabin. This is quite a lot of airspace. Like if you put this same wall in a, a small shit box, like a little uh, hatchback or something, then obviously there'd be a lot more pressure and it'd be a lot windier. But this is a really big cabin to pressurize. So from a pair of 15s um, on, on a 4K, it's not, it's not too bad. I used to love this track back in the day. Oh my. Oh my gosh, cheesy. <laughs> So there's a couple of demos for you. Now, I don't really ever meter this van. It's it's not designed to do crazy numbers. Like a pair of DDZ 415s, like in a, in a numbers build, should be doing like 160s, 165, 170s, you know, extreme stuff. But this is a musical daily build and uh, stock alternator still. <laughs> so, um, so I'm never really interested in what numbers it does. I think the last time I metered it just for fun, um, it was with the Z4s. It was on less power than I have had in here. Um, and it peaks at 25 hertz, this build, this cabin, signal the thing the, the peak is 25 Hertz and it did a 156 I think it just scraped to 156 and the limiting factor is the mechanical excursion this box this, this sixth order was designed for 35 series 15s not Z4 15s so I need to shrink the uh, the load chamber down and increase the port area if I wanted to put more power on it to get louder than that there is loads more in it like the subs are, don't never get warm they're stone cold all the time even after hours of demos so there's definitely loads more in it if I wanted it um, but just for fun i'm limited on power with this 4k so the excursion limit shouldn't really be a problem i'm definitely reaching clip point on this before the subs are reaching their mechanical limit so that's good in a sense so let's just meter this and see what the hell is doing so to quickly meter this we're going to be using the spl lab next lcd it is accurate to the term lab uh, term lab magnum i think it's calibrated to um in the uk for proper droppers, we test with the um, meter on the headrest. Um, I have forgotten a strap, so I'm just gonna shove it in there to get a rough idea. I'll also try it on the screen in a minute as well. Um, but obviously with the lower frequencies, we are loudest with passenger door wide open and driver's door closed or the sensor side closed. Um, I don't have any door pushes, so it would be louder if I had some guys to push the doors. So with the current setup, I'd be surprised if it breaks a 150 to be honest, but uh, let's just see what it does. 25 Hertz first. 
So a 148 at 25, okay. Maybe my peak is different without people pushing the doors because this door is going absolutely wild at 25. Let's try 28. Okay, definitely a different peak. So that was a 151.4 at 28. Now you can see I'm rolling it right up into clipping. Obviously that's what you want to do when you're competing, when you're doing burps like this. Clipping does make it louder. You don't want to be doing that when you're demoing or dailying, but the little bit of clip that you add does translate into more cone movement and therefore a louder score. So we just roll it up into a bit of clipping and down again. Okay, seeing as this is a bit louder on the, the slightly higher stuff, let's try a 32 and see what that does. Oh yeah, 152.37 at 32 hertz. Okay, getting louder, let's try a 35. I think that was about the same, 152.49. I'm gonna do a 33 hertz. Uh, I feel like 33 hertz is a lot of people's favorites and it's where many cars just seem to peak anyway, which is a bit weird, but let's try a 33. A 152.73. I think that's the loudest we're gonna get, to be honest, today. Just for shits and giggles, let's try some of those frequencies with this on the screen. I don't really know how you do it in the States, but I guess you put that on the screen there. The door's still open because I need the wire coming through from the back, so we can't really do it sealed up. Oh, okay, I'm actually a touch louder on the windshield then, it seems. 153.07 at 33. And just because with the higher frequencies, I feel like the pressure builds at the front better. I'm going to try. I'm going to try 68. Try 68 hertz on the on the screen there with both doors open. Just just have interest. Fucking hell! I hate those high frequencies. 151.02. So yeah, it is a little bit louder at the um, front there with the higher frequencies. So yeah, different competition formats depending on where you put your sensor will benefit from different frequencies yeah, with every vehicle and every vehicle is different. Acoustics are a weird and wonderful thing. Um, I am hungry. I'm gonna go get some lunch. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope that this has given you an insight into the new Digital Designs M series of amplifiers, what they're all about, how they sound. Look out for some dyno video. I, I don't have an amp dyno. I am prepared to spend like 10 grand on what is essentially a multimeter and clamp meter, but I'm sure that there will emerge some dyno videos of these amplifiers shortly, and I imagine that they will be putting out more than rated power, which is kind of the trend with digital designs amplifiers, and it definitely sounds more than a 4K here. Just for reference, um, I did for a couple of weeks run a sound digital um, Evo 8K, which claims about just over 10K at 14 volts, two ohm, a two ohm version amplifier, and I ran them up at two ohms. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is louder or as loud as the um, 8K Sound Digital, which actually would make sense because I'm wiring this down to 0.5, essentially this 4K amplifier will act and behave like an 8K with the amount of rise I've got. So that probably makes sense. If you liked the video, subscribe. My subscribe account is like tick, 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 one subscriber every two years. So um, if you did like it, do subscribe. I do live streams on amplifier repair and I go over new emerging amplifiers and I'm also planning loads of really interesting videos which will help you out with your car audio system and how to get the most out of it. So stay tuned, have a good day, I'll see you next time.